The challenge is to build a dinosaur in three months. I promised a small museum in Lusk, Wyoming that I would build a life-size Triceratops skeleton by the end of the summer. Well, today is June 1st. That means I have to find a Triceratops, excavate those bones, clean those bones, then build the skeleton in three months. Can we do it? Well, as soon as I load this van full of my supplies, we're out of here. All kinds of animals live here in the grasslands of Wyoming today. But what did this place look like 65 million years ago? We have to look for clues from the past, and fossils give us those clues. A fossil is any kind of evidence of ancient life. Things like bones and teeth and seashells and seeds from ancient plants that were buried deep underground thousands or millions of years ago and are still there today are called fossils. If we look in the rocks beneath these grasslands, we might find some fossil clues. Raptor. Here I found a few fossils. It's a Triceratops tooth, some carnivorous dinosaur teeth, alligator bones, and an alligator tooth, soft shelled turtle bones, a garfish scale, and a pine cone from a sequoia tree. Based on these clues, can you guess what kind of habitat these plants and animals lived in millions of years ago? The swamp habitat, like in parts of modern Louisiana today. Footprints can also be fossils. Here we have two footprints from a dinosaur called Struthiomimus. Struthiomimus is like a 15 foot tall ostrich that was a meat eater and it walked across his ancient riverbed and left these footprints in the mud. You can see the three toes pointing forward. One, two, and three. Maybe it was going hunting, going to sleep, who knows, going to get a drink of water. Whatever it did, it left these two footprints in the mud. Now these footprints are evidence of ancient life. Therefore, footprints are a kind of fossil. Fossils are the evidence that give us clues to the past. Paleontologists are the kinds of scientists that study fossils. Hi, I'm Paul Serino, a paleontologist from the University of Chicago. This is one tooth and this one toe bone from one of the world's largest predatory dinosaurs, Tyrannosaurus rex. Was Tyrannosaurus the largest predatory dinosaur? Well, it certainly was here. Triceratops and duckbills, its favorite food. This monster meat eater was the largest meat eater that roamed on North America. From up here, we can see how hills and valleys are weathered away by wind and rain. Rivers and streams transport the soil away. is erosion.
Erosion is a force of nature. These big boulders, they were up there, but wind, rain, snow, ice causes these rocks to break apart and tumble downhill and get washed downstream. You see, erosion causes dinosaur bones to be buried millions of years ago. Then today, erosion causes them to be weathered to the surface once again so I can find them. That's erosion. It's a force of nature. It's now June 15th, and I haven't found a Triceratops skeleton yet. I'd like to find a leg or two, or maybe half a skull. There's a paleontologist. Let's go ask him. Marcus, how you doing? Hey there, Craig. How are you? It's good to see you again. What do you have here? What are you working on? A duck-billed dinosaur. Um, oh, cool. It's covered right now, but we have the, the legs, hips, part of the tail, and part of the back over there. It's all hooked together. And behind me, there's a lot of other bones we just started to uncover, so I don't know what all's there, but another skull's in there. It's a duckbill, you say? Absolutely. It's wonderful. Can we see more? Sure. Great. Which bones are these? This is the left humerus. That's the upper arm bone. This is the shoulder port. And then here we have down where the elbow would be. It's not obviously not a real big animal. Big ones would have a humerus like so. So this, you say, is a humerus. Exactly. Like my elbow is where this dinosaur's elbow is. Exactly. And it goes up along here to, well, my shoulder is lower, obviously, but their shoulder a little bit higher. Is this an adult size? No, this is a teenager. As duckbills go, it was maybe, oh, more than half size animal, but not an adult. So her arm is even bigger than this? In full size animals, absolutely. Sorry, you're just not as big as a dinosaur. <laughs> well, we're looking for a triceratops. You seen any? I wish I had one for you, but we've been spending all of our time working on this duckbill. But Triceratops are seven times as abundant as duckbills in the Lance, so you should be able to find one if you're persistent. Well, I guess we're off to go look. Thank you very much. Good luck, Marcus. Thanks for showing us uh, your excavation. Always a pleasure. Take care. You too. I found these bones here a little while ago. Here's a piece of a Triceratops frill. That's the big shield behind a Triceratops' skull. And here are some bits of ribs. So I found these bones up the hillside. Here's what I found. This is a piece of a Triceratops frill. Here's some small frill pieces right below it. There's a skull in here, I'm sure of it. Now behind me, I also found a Triceratops rib. On that side, there's another rib. So we have two ribs and two pieces of frill. That tells me that there's a skull in here and part of the body. This is the Triceratops I'm looking for. This is worth excavating. Now it's time to start digging. As I excavate, I'm looking for clues that might help me to understand what happened to this dinosaur 65 million years ago. Things like bite marks and scratches and breaks in the bones, now those are clues. If I'm lucky, I'll find some clues and hopefully a few more bones. But what happens if I don't find any more bones? When paleontologists dig up dinosaurs, they never find the whole thing. If you find half a skeleton or more, that's pretty good. Now, what do you do about the missing bones? What I've decided to do is to make the missing bones out of steel. Here's the, the femur, the upper leg bone, the thigh bone, cut out in steel. 
Now what museums do, they make plastic or plaster replicas of those missing bones. So when you go look at a dinosaur in a museum, you're not looking at the whole skeleton as far as those being real bones. It's usually half real and half cast or replicas. What I'm going to do is make them in steel so you can really tell what's real and what's not. Hi, my name is Pete Larson and I'm a paleontologist and president of Black Hills Institute in Hill City, South Dakota. When we see a dinosaur like this mounted in a museum, are all of those bones real? Well, the answer to that question is no. You see, when we find a skeleton like this, even though this is the second most complete T-Rex that's ever been found, we were missing one third of those bones. And so we had to make those bones out of plastics and clays and whatever we could find to recreate the skeleton as it was inside that dinosaur when it was alive. What we do as paleontologists, we study the animals that live today. We study how they behave, their bodies are structured, their anatomy. Those observations give us clues to how the past may have been. It's amazing that these bison help us to understand dinosaurs like Triceratops. Triceratops was an herbivore. It would wander across its landscape eating grass like these bison do. If you observe these bison, if you watch how the males interact or how the females care for their young, how the males and females interact, and even watch how the herd moves across the prairie. You can imagine Triceratops doing the same thing. You see, the present is our key to the past. What I'm doing now, I'm trying to expose this rib. This is the first bone we found in the, in the excavation. When I was prospecting before, I saw the edge of this, the broken edge of the rib. Now we followed it back, and it keeps going. I'm kind of curious if it's a complete rib or a broken rib. So I'm using an old dull pocket knife and very carefully picking away at the rock that's on top of the bone. I pick a little bit, I brush a little, and I keep doing this until I expose the entire rib. And as I see small broken cracks in the bone, I drip one small drop of glue onto the broken cracks and the glue runs between the broken pieces of bone. So it's a process of removing rock, brushing away the rock, exposing the bone, and then putting glue on the cracks. This is perhaps a surprise in this excavation. It's the horn of Triceratops. It's the right horn over the eyebrow. And it's missing the tip. And where it's gone, I don't know. I think this dinosaur tumbled downstream for quite a ways, and the tip of the horn broke off. The edge of the, uh, the base of the horn is missing as well. And there are a few other smaller bones that are under this horn. This is part of a rib. This is also a piece of a rib. Um, so what I'm doing now, once again, I'm very carefully picking away at the sediment around the edge of the horn. Our next step is going to be to put a plaster jacket around this bone and our, our lower jaw back over there to safely transport it out of the ground and back to our preparation lab. It's now July 19th and we're ready to have these bones come out of the excavation. I have a few friends here to help me. And what we're doing, the first stage in removing the bones is to create plaster jackets around the bones to make them very safe to transport. So what we're doing here, we're digging around the bone on all sides. I'm going to make a small tunnel right through here. And the step after that is to take strips of burlap, soak them in plaster of Paris, and make a cast around the bone. Once that cast hardens, then I can safely transport this bone out of the excavation site and to my laboratory for preparation. towards me, very gently, a controlled roll. As it tips over, put your hands on the dirt on the underside to make sure no dirt or bones fall out. You ready? Very carefully. 
carefully. Get your hand there. Good job. Roll it towards me. <laughs> Perfect. We're in a preparation lab in a museum, and this is where they bring the bones when they get them out of the ground. They bring them here, and they very carefully and meticulously remove the rock away from the bone surface. There are a bunch of tools here. They have, these are common, little dental tools, which we use to chip the pieces of rock away from the bone surface. There are always paintbrushes here, and, oh, here we go. This is called an air scribe. <laughs> They use this to, uh, to also remove the rock from the bone surface. Remember when we dug up that Triceratops lower jaw and had a plaster jacket? Well, when museums, when they collect those dinosaurs, they bring them back to their museum in the basement, and here's where they store them. Here's a T-Rex that was collected, Tyrannosaurus rex. Now, all these bones, they're in those plaster jackets. That's how you safely transport the bones to the museum. Now, they cleaned up one bone that I want to show you. Can you guess what this is? I'll give you a hint. In some animals today, if you break this bone, you can make a wish. It's a wishbone. Tyrannosaurus rex had a wishbone right above their chest. This is not a real T-Rex, of course. It's a replica. This is how paleontologists and museums share their fossils. Now, what paleontologists do to make copies of their fossils, they first take their original bone and they'll cover it in silicone rubber. Here is one side of three T-Rex foot bones. Then they'll make the second side. This is called a mold. Then what they'll do, they'll put these two sides together and pour liquid plastic in the middle. And that plastic hardens, you're left with this finished product. This is the three toe bones of T-Rex. It's not real but it has the exact same shape and texture of T-Rex toes. And then you can share these casts with other museums. This is a really special place. It's called the KT boundary. That means Cretaceous and Tertiary. Cretaceous is the last part of the age of dinosaurs, and Tertiary identifies the age of birds and mammals. So right here, is when dinosaurs disappeared worldwide. But what caused dinosaur extinction? Now there are a bunch of ideas that scientists have. Maybe small mammals ate their eggs and they couldn't reproduce. Or perhaps they ate flowering plants which had just evolved and that poisoned them. Perhaps they shared disease. Maybe aliens came and got them. There are a bunch of ideas. But scientists base their ideas on evidence. Evidence, that's the physical stuff that you can look at that gives you clues to the past. When we analyze this layer, we find some interesting clues, bits of evidence, like iridium. Iridium is an element that you find in outer space, in meteorites and asteroids. Well, you also find lots of iridium right here in this layer. And you find no more dinosaurs above this layer. If you go to Mexico and the Yucatan Peninsula, there's a big giant crater that's at the same layer as this KT boundary. What does this evidence tell you? It must have been a meteorite impact. And here's the evidence right here. It's a pretty special place. This bird is an emu, a land-dwelling bird. Some scientists think that birds evolved from dinosaurs. Now, what are the clues? If you look at their feet, they have three toes pointing forward. Well, dinosaurs like Tyrannosaurus rex and Velociraptor they have three toes pointing forward. Their feet are covered with scales. Dinosaurs also had scales. We have found skin impressions from some dinosaurs. They're full of scales. When these birds lay eggs, they lay big, beautiful blue eggs with a very hard shell. Only dinosaurs have hard-shelled eggs. We know reptiles lay eggs, but they're soft-shelled. Fish lay eggs, they're soft-shelled. Frogs, salamanders, amphibians, they lay eggs, they're soft-shelled. But birds and dinosaurs lay hard-shelled eggs. Some birds even have claws on their wings. It's an ancestral trait they don't use anymore, but they still have it. This is great evidence that birds and dinosaurs are related. Look at the coloration in the neck. 
the beautiful blue, the white and black feathers. Imagine dinosaurs with the same kinds of colors. Whoa, it's a beautiful animal. Could dinosaurs have been blue or pink? Who knows? Did dinosaurs walk the same way? Did dinosaurs do that? Maybe so. One week to go. I've just begun assembling this dinosaur. The steel work is finally done. What's left to do now is to install the real bones. Like this vertebrae. This goes in the middle of the back. What I plan to do is cut out the steel and put the bone right in place. This lower jaw, or dentary, it fits right here. What I'm going to do is cut away at the steel, then put this lower jaw in its correct position, about right here. This toe bone, or metatarsal, it's going to fit right here on the dinosaur's foot. Now I've got two holes drilled back here so I can bolt it right in place. So in the end, what you're gonna see is a half steel, half real skeleton. I have two days left to get the bones on this skeleton. Time to break it down, back to the workshop. The grand opening is in 36 hours. The skull's not even complete yet. Now the bones are all prepared. I spend a lot of time picking on the bones, getting all the dirt away. Now to mount the skeleton. You can see I've got the nose horn here. Here's some parts of the face and the lower jaw. Remember this bone? This is the first one we found that first day. It's a piece of the frill. Now it's mounted in its correct place. What goes on next is the horn. This horn fits about right here. I gotta figure out exactly how it goes. Then I'm gonna put some brackets on it and weld it in place. 36 hours left. A lot of work ahead. I am Noel Larson. I am chairman of the board for the Stagecoach Museum. We have uh, quite a variety of different wagons and western uh, products that were used when this west was being saddled. I think the dinosaur will have a place in our museum. Younger people are going to be quite interested. This is going to be the only dinosaur in Niobrara County, Wyoming. Now that's actually very interesting because for the past century, dinosaurs have come from this county. There are dinosaurs in Germany, in England, all across the northeast of the United States. Lots of T-Rexes, Triceratops, and Duckbills all come from here. But none of those dinosaurs stayed in this county. This is the first time that a dinosaur stays in this famous location. This dinosaur-rich bed of rock is located. It's pretty cool.
the last few minutes of three months of work. We begin searching and searching for fossils. We find our triceratops. We spend about a month to dig it up, then almost a month to clean the bones. And in the meantime, I was cutting steel. We didn't waste a single minute, even now. That's it. We're done. Three months down to the wire, and we got to finish in time. I knew we could do it. Like I said, I'm jumping into town. Everything's finished. We're up till four o'clock in the morning, mining the skeleton, getting the bones in their proper place. But we're done. It's time to go to the museum. I'll see you there. to thank all the town folk for uh, for hosting me this summer. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Very thank you. Once the paleontologist cleans the bones, the next thing to do... Let me just think for a second. Flies. They're everywhere. Shows all the detail of Tyrannosaurus rex and their feet bones, foot bones. If you have breaks in your bones, use Paleobond. I could fall asleep. So these clues help us to understand what happened to dinosaurs. <laughs> There's one about to peck you. <laughs>